thank you very much, everybody, for uh, coming out today. I guess uh, I'm relatively new to seeing machines. I'd be uh, pretending, uh, unlike the previous uh, uh, presenter who's been with uh, his company since the beginning, I've been here for four months. And uh, I guess seeing machines has been invited here today because it's been a customer of uh, government funding for a long time uh, through various stages of its life, but also hopefully because it's achieved something Hopefully, also because it's achieved something with that uh, with that capital that it's been granted. I guess, like any organization, Seeing Machines has been on a journey that started in uh, 2000, and the uh, the original concept was uh, based on an idea held within uh, the Australian National University in Canberra, and for s several years, I'll let that finish. The, uh, yeah, so originally a, um, a concept held within Australian National University and uh, a project on computer vision uh, in collaboration with Volvo. The company was spun out in uh, 2000 and uh, became Seeing Machines, opened the doors in 2000 as a, as a business uh, funded by, partly by the university and then very quickly commercialized its first product, FaceLab, in 2001 and then be went on a long journey, an arduous journey, raising capital, listing on the UK stock exchange on the alternative market, the secondary market called the AIM, and then commercializing a series of products uh, over the next few years. And those have all been based on uh, one core technology. So from ANU, I guess the story is if you mix a, a relatively wacky professor with three PhD students, you might end up with a company. Uh, the as I said, that it really based on a, a, a concept of computer vision, using computers to, using helping a camera on a computer become an input device instead of a really a tunnel to pass information through to somebody else. And Seeing Machines still lives by that today. Uh, Seeing Machines is, a, is what I would term a, a very, a, a great research and development house. It's a place where people get to do amazing things and as a result, a company that gets to house amazing people, people that want to work there and be part of a team. So the hard part, I think the, the research and development is ongoing and never ending. And uh, the, the, the harder part is probably the foreseeing machines at least, and as Nuzio men mentioned earlier, the, the commercialization is much more challenging for us. We've got one core technology, uh, computer vision-based technology, We've got four products, distinct products, FaceLab, Face API, and the driver state system, DSS, and Truefield, in four distinct markets around the world. So it's a small company, and it might as well be four companies. So Face API, I'm going to give you a demonstration of this core technology if it works in this lighting environment. Uh, what you're going to see is Face API. I'm going to see if I can toggle to a Windows emulator and see if it can kind of get a little bit lower. So I don't know if you guys can see what I can see. Yeah. So what just happened when the camera saw my face, it looked for things, human characteristics. It found some eyes, it found some nostrils, it found the corners of my mouth, and it's basically locked onto my face now. So this computer is now knows whether I'm turning left or right, and I could, I could turn, set it so it, it, well, it knows that my mouth is moving, and I could let it show you my lips and my facial expressions, whether my eyes were closing or opening, blinking, etc. I don't have any of those turned on right now, eyebrow movement. And I guess the, its, it's purpose is, uh, is multiple, but it's really seeing machines found, foundation technology, and it's used by a bunch of different people for a bunch of different things, and I will take you, maybe just tell you a little bit about those. I guess the uh, various sectors, consumer electronics uh, and entertainment, as well as more, uh, I guess, rugged types of technology. For example, Toshiba's new glasses-free uh, Cosimo laptop uses this technology to know where the, the user's face is. Uh, a number of, uh, I guess, marketing and advertising companies using it for digital billboards in North America. As you walk up to a sign, it might superimpose characteristics of a, a, a character from a movie on top of your face or a pair of sunglasses. So sort of smart advertising. Uh, but its main driver 
is, I guess, it, the future of computing. If you think about how we've been using computers, you know, we've been using keyboards for 50 plus years, we've been using the mouse for 30 plus years, and if you think about how we're interacting with our devices now, with hand gestures on, on handheld devices or on glide pads, et cetera, it's what we're calling perceptual computing. And the next step of that is very much the minority report type things where people are going to be moving things in midair. And that's not very far off. And to be able to do that, you need to not only be able to see the person's hand position and what they're doing with their hand, but you also have to understand where they're looking. I'll toggle back to my presentation. So that's Face API. And, but it's also used for entertainment purposes. And uh, this is an uh, artist that um, a short video, I won't run the whole thing, but basically uh, a Canadian artist that's world famous for his installations, and uh, by coincidence, he's got a presentation, he's got a show starting on the 15th of December at the Sydney's uh, Museum of Modern Art. And so again, so here basically he's using face tracking technology from seeing machines basically to identify the face, remove the person's eyeballs, and fill the room with smoke out of the person's eyes. So it's, it's used for all sorts of things. Um, and, but it's, the challenge is for us is that it's a piece of middleware. We don't tell the end market how to use it. We help the end market understand how it might possibly be used. And it's really in the hands of clever, creative people all around the world that decide what to do with it. So face tracking is pretty cool. It's neat. It's a, a, a technology that's come a long way. And I guess where face API sits in the spectrum, you've got very, very advanced face tracking used for post-production, video production. If you want to put a texture onto an actor's face for a movie, you would basically capture the, the original video. You would select your textures. Then you would run it through a computer overnight. And the next day, you'd come back. After it had been processed by a powerful computer, you'd come back, and your, your effects would be done. On the other end, you've got very low-level face tracking. For example, with a $50 digital camera, you turn on. It puts a little yellow box around the user's head. But if you held up a coconut with two dots on it, it would think that was a face just as well. And where seeing machines technology sits in between, it allows a, a standard web camera on a standard computer to track your face, lock in on your face very robustly, but still leave 95 plus percent of the CPU available for the computer to do other things. So that's face tracking. And again, through research and development within seeing machines, at some point somebody said, well, you know, we've got, we now can see the face. Can we look deeper into the person's eyes? And so we came up with eye tracking. And so now we, eye tracking is all about understanding where people are looking or what people are looking at. The previous product basically looks at a head pose and determines, you know, we, we don't work like this with our eyes turned to the side. By, our physiology dictates that our eyes are aimed where our, our neck is aiming our head. But for example, uh, well, the company launched Face Lab, which again, underpinned by the same core technology. And FaceLab is eye gaze tracking, and it's predominantly a research tool. It's used by virtually every automotive, uh, aircraft, spacecraft manufacturer around the world. And what these, this set of stereoscopic cameras allows you to do, set up in front of the user in a s relatively confined environment where they can't move out of the, out of the environment, uh, basically can tell by looking at the eyes, by beaming a small infrared light source into the user's eyes, it can then track that glint and measure exactly precisely where you're looking down to about the size of a five cent Australian piece. So if, for example, in a car, a car manufacturer uh, or an airplane sim manufacturer would put this into their simulator first and basically design the ergonomics of the cockpit or cabin so that instruments and controls fall to the hand of the user as easily as possible or as quickly as possible. So that's gaze tracking. And I guess what seeing machines discovered is now that they could know where a person's head was positioned and what they were looking at, somebody thought, you know, could we look deeper into the user's eyes and look at how they're looking and how they're using their eyes? So this is what we call medical grade pupil tracking. And so seeing machine has spent six or seven years of research, expensive research, uh, to develop applications for those sciences. And they've come up with two basically, the DSS, or driver state sensor, and Truefield. Now, DSS uh, has been commercialized. Truefield is, is still in testing. It's final phase of medical testing. It has FDA approval. But the driver state sensor, I guess, is really seeing machines bread and butter now and core uh, revenue generator. What it does, we all know that Australia and other countries are experiencing this incredible mining boom all around the world. Mining companies are, are growing at a huge rate. We have gold at you know, four or $500 an ounce above mining companies' budgets. We have China's demand for coal. We have people wanting 
virtually everything that's in the ground, uh, precious earth, rare earth, diamonds. Uh, and with that boom comes a problem. The, uh, all these countries with mines are exploiting or, or, or explo either exploiting uh, uh, staff or facing a huge shortage of staff. And the mines are being driven 24 hours a day, seven days a week, people driving heavy vehicles in relatively dangerous conditions through the night, uh, regardless of weather. And with that comes a lot of risk. And one of them, the big one, is driver fatigue. Uh, BHP, for example, their risk matrix for uh, mine site, nothing comes anywhere close to the risk of a runaway vehicle. That's, I think, nine times higher than the next closest risk. And most runaway vehicles are due to the driver falling asleep temporarily or, or longer. Now, being able to look at uh, a user's eyes, the way DSS works, basically a little camera sitting on the dash or on the console in a, a truck, again using infrared so it can see through the uh, sunglasses or at night in the dark, basically provides three things. The first one is in-cabin mitigation. So the driver, as, when a certain set of characteristics are met, basically the, it's measuring something called per-close, the frequency of blinking, the acceleration of the eyelid, the position of the head, and the... Um, uh, the duration between blinks. So when a certain set of those characteristics come together, it's really preempting just right, you're right on the verge of a micro sleep. And what it does, it sounds an alarm in the cabin uh, at a vehicle level, giving an audio alert to the driver, a shriek of a, a buzzer, and a seat vibration to wake them up and hopefully keep them on the road. The next step in real time, basically using uh, the mine's Wi-Fi network or GSM network, the information is broadcast through the mine site uh, network to the dispatcher, who on a console can basically see what truck, where they are, how fast they're traveling, and basically the driver's fatigue history for the duration of that shift, and then can basically intervene if they feel it's required. So get on the radio, uh, Ken, I'll meet you at the fuel, deep, fuel depot, I'll bring you a cup of coffee, and uh, we'll have a talk to see if you can continue safely. And it's amazing what it picks up when we first uh, activate this system for a four-week period, it's activated without any in-cab alert. So it's put in the cabin of the truck. The driver's made aware of what it does, but nothing happens. And after a few weeks, so it starts with a very, very rapid decline in fatigue and distraction-related events. Also, because it can tell where you're supposed to be looking, it watches you for the first three or four minutes and identifies that that must be the road straight ahead. When you deviate your gaze away from that frontal area of the vehicle, after a few seconds, it'll again alert you that you've been looking away from the front, from out the front window for a while. So what we notice right away is that there's a, a very sudden decrease in the uh, fatigue and distraction events. And after four or five nights or days of, of drivers working the, uh, these vehicles, the, uh, the behavior returns to their previous level. And it's because there are no alarms, nothing's happening, and they convince themselves that th the system isn't actually working. And so we see it come back. And then after a four to six week period, we activate it, but with a fatigue management program. And then we see a consistent drop of 75 to 80% in fatigue. And that, that drop is sustainable over the duration of the system, uh, of the system's implementation. Then the third range is a post-event uh, validation, where basically the information is transferred to our data center in Houston, Arizona, or Tucson, Arizona, sorry, uh, where it is analyzed by an analyst post-event, and we can benchmark the shift against shift, the mine against mine sites, and the company against other companies for the uh, health and safety people within the organization to see how they're performing. So that's more of a corporate level and uh, with a, a large back-end database, basically allowing them to drive policy within the organization and make their people and keep their people safer. So the product's in over 40 mine sites and five continents, and we're keeping thousands of drivers safe and getting them home safe to their families after their shifts. So I guess that's a, a good example of how a company's research and ongoing research covering the same core technology over a period of seven years allowed them to develop basically a product that is now keeping people safe. And Seeing Machines has benefited from uh, commercialization Australia or uh, the Department of or Oz Industries funding capability uh, through every phase of its life cycle for every one of its products, and it continues to do so. 
Uh, I mentioned the uh, driver state system, uh, DSS, and also uh, touched on Truefield. Truefield is a product that's currently in development, again, using uh, taxpayers' money in Australia. It's a medical device that looks even deeper into the eyes and originally was conceived to be able to detect the early onset of glaucoma uh, by measuring the involuntary response to a light source. And through testing, it's now being FDA approved for glaucoma testing, but it's now also we've detected that, and, and it appears that it'll work equally well, if not better, to detect uh, age-related macular degeneration, as well as diabetic retinopathy, and possibly even a precursor to a stroke. So again, it's another research program, uh, you know, world-leading researchers working in Australia, developing technology that hopefully seeing machines will be able to, techno to commercialize, and that wouldn't be done without government funding. I guess that's, that's it for me on seeing machines.